All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, creatives of all ages. We are back for our next presenter here at the Maxon booth. For those of you who don't know, this is a continuation of the 3D Motion Show. So check out 3dmotionshow.com. That's where we stream live every month throughout the season. Oh, hey. Hi, Phil. Hey. Thank you. Thanks for waving. Appreciate that. Then don't you feel better there's now? Real, there's really no one out there. No. People, it's all for the internet. Yeah, that yeah. This is all AI-generated people. Welcome yes. to MetaHumans with Cinema. No, okay. <laughs> so, uh, we have amazing presenters all throughout the day. A long-time uh, supporter of the community, educator, amazing artist. He makes some of the cutest darn things you'll ever see. Let's give a big round of applause to EJ Hassan for us. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Maxon. Thank you, everyone. That is, We are here. We're back. Holy cow, and there's people behind this giant monitor. Thank you for coming out. Everyone on the internet, thank you. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, my name is EJ Hassenfratz. I'm creative director at School of Motion, uh, where I actually have taught a couple classes about Cinema 4D. So if you're new to Cinema 4D, or you've wanted to get into Cinema 4D, learn a little bit more about it, S School of Motion has you covered. We basically got like these two classes, a bunch of other classes. We have teaching assistants. So if you really want to learn software, this is the place to go. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, I've been using Cinema 4D for, oh my God, like 12, 13 years now. And the reason why I have done it is because it's just so easy to use. It's very intuitive how it works. It's kind of, I call it an artist tool because it kind of just gets out of your way and lets you create. So that's why I've been loving Cinema 4D. That's why I've been repping it for so long and have been making training content on it for forever. Um, so for those of you who might not know what I do, the type of work I do, uh, like I said, I'm mainly a creative director at School of Motion. I've been doing the, you know, the whole NFT thing now, uh, doing a lot of personal projects. But I just wanted to show uh, a little bit of my reel to show you what I do. And this is the first time I'm actually using a PC, so a lot's changed in uh, three years since we've done this. But So I might screw things up because I'm like totally a Mac person, but uh, here is my reel. And now I don't know how to get out of this. This is how bad. Oh, there we go. I'm new to the PC, babe. All right, let's go back into here. PowerPoint, first time using PowerPoint as well. <laughs> All right. So what, are we, what am I doing here today? I'm following up Grun Kim, who uh, I'm not as good as. So this isn't going to be as good of a presentation as that. Just, just a fair warning. Uh, but I'm going to show you how to do some nature bashing. You've heard of kit bashing before, right? You get all these kits. Got David Airy. I've done a ton of tutorials on them. The thing is, you're always doing them in Octane, right? But I want to I share with you how you can actually do this kind of stuff in Redshift. So here is a little bit of the process I'll be showing. Uh, where we're just going to build up like a landscape object, throw some materials on it, uh, do some like ground cover, uh, and a bunch of different assets to build up a nice looking nature scene composition uh, with with uh, you know a Sasquatch in it maybe or maybe not. Uh, so, so the one question we always get is, what render do you use? And I just want to take a little second to <laughs> seeing a lot of nodding heads out there. Uh, to, to just kind of say that, you know, there's a lot of artists out there that actually use multiple render engines, and I'll always tell you that it's not about what the render engine brings to the art, it's, it's what the artist can actually bring to the render engine, and they're just tools at the end of the day. So you could use one paintbrush as a painter, you can use five. You know, it's all about what that artist is doing with that paintbrush. But 
Uh, I will say I use Octane and Redshift. Uh, and why I'm using Redshift a lot more now is just, uh, well, number one, they, it's now included in Cinema 4D, the CPU version, which is cool. And just the way that it works, it's the unbiased uh, render engine where you can, am I doing that right? I always confuse the unbiased or bias. Is it unbiased? Redshift? Redshift is biased. Okay, see, I always screw it up. So bias meaning that we can have bias to break physical reality constraints. Unbiased is like, this is how it works in the real world, bro. Can't do anything other than that. Uh, so that's kind of how uh, physical render and standard render inside of Cinema 4D works. So I've just been able to you know, translate over to Redshift and uh, do just fine. Uh, and this, these videos won't work, but let me show you the final version of what we'll be making today. There we go. Nice little scene here. Got some volumetric, animated volumetric lighting. I can't get rid of this bottom bar. Windows. Dang it, Windows. Uh, but I'll be showing you how to build up basically everything. Also talk a little bit about lighting, composition, uh, and, and that kind of good stuff. So that's what we'll be making today. Um, so how I started to like create that scene is I always recommend you go on Pinterest or whatever and get a lot of references and mood boards because it can really help you kind of narrow your focus. You know, we always have that imposter syndrome. We freeze if we can just do anything. Like if you're told as an artist, like go create anything you want, you're just gonna be like, well, I don't know what to create. There's so many things. So always trying to get references and trying to go and narrow that, uh, that direction any way you can is great. So, you know, after going through Pinterest a little bit, I found some of these cool like, uh, like foresty Japanese scenes where you got like temples, we got all this really cool moss. I just love the super saturated green of like the fog in some of these. And I love these little statues, which they're called Jizo statues. Uh, and they're Japanese, they're like little baby Buddha people. And they're like super cute. And I was like, yes, okay, I'm gonna make something. But I'm gonna make a pug version because I'm a pug dad and love pugs. Yeah, give it up for pugs. Uh, <laughs> And so I was like, I'll make that. That'll be kind of the focus, uh, like the hero element of this forest scene. Because you can see that, you know, when you have shots like this, like, yeah, that's pretty, but where are you looking at? Like, there's no hero element. So that's kind of what that is. Uh, but yeah, I just love the, like, super foggy atmospheric vibe of, of what was going on here. So <clears throat> first, I'm going to show you how to, like, just build up your basic uh, landscape first and then we'll just kind of move on from there. So let's uh, dive into Cinema 4D, and let's start a new project. And when you're doing nature scenes, and I know I've heard David Ariev here say he doesn't go to scale ever, <laughs> he doesn't care about it. So I, I don't know, I, I think you could probably do that, but I always try to uh, actually have a, like a figure in here, which is actually like based off of the size of a six foot person, and then you build out from there. And why that is, uh, like I said, you don't have to do it. But uh, these render engines, they work off of like real world units. So if you want things to look like super realistic, you want to use a light and the fall off is usually a set distance. And when you have a massive scene, sometimes the values you pump in could be super huge or super small if, you're, if your scene's super tiny. So I always start with a figure object just to get a sense of scale. And then I'll go ahead and I'll just create a plane object first and just like scale it up and there's our nature scene right there. See you tomorrow. No. Uh, let's go and hit N and then B, because that'll bring up our garage shading with lines. You can also do that by just going up uh, here as well. It's always good to like memorize some of these commands here. And you'll see we don't have a lot of geometry. And what I'm ultimately going to be doing is displacing and, and deforming this, uh, this plane object. And let's actually rename this ground. And let's just up the segments here. I'll do like 2, 2, 2. 222, two, two, or maybe 333, three, three. just to get enough of a detail here. And I'll just move this back. Because really, my camera angle will probably be somewhere like this. So I don't need like all this space back here, right? So I can just push all this back. And then how I'm going to build up some detail, let's hit N and then A to just go back to our garage shading with outlines. And I'm just going to grab a displacer, actually, I'll just do shift C. Uh-oh. 
Shift C. There you go. That's the commander. I'm just going to go and enter in displacer, hit enter, and then go and place this underneath the uh, as a child of this ground. I didn't even spell ground object, so grood. I am grood. Uh, and we'll get a displacer, and this will allow us to displace this object. And so what I'm going to do now is go into the shading tab, and I'm just going to load up a noise. And you can see uh, all this kind of janky uh, geometry here. Uh, you can choose whatever noise you want. Fun fact, in, in the newer versions of Cinema 4D, uh, there's actually this little empty area here. There used to be an arrow. I hope they put it back. But if you click on that, you can actually see a visualization of all the different types of noises that you want to use. And some of these are like really good for landscape-y kind of things. Uh, one of those is like Naki, and I found that you have to really crank up the values here to like, let's do 33333, three, 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 four, 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 four. Doing the Chris Schmidt shortcut of just hitting the same key over and over again. And you can see this looks like pretty cool, like organic kind of landscape. Uh, we can do this, and this is going to be like our like more low fidelity detail, which means just like, just very broad strokes of, of landscape. So like, Low fidelity, or just you know, low detail. And let's make this even bigger, maybe. Five, 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 five. Five. Okay. And then we'll go into our object tab and just crank this up even more. So something like that. It's getting there. And then what I'm going to do is just command click and drag to duplicate that displacer. And this will be like our higher fidelity detail. And for this, It'll be a little less of the height there. And I'll get shading, go to the noise again. And I'll choose a different type of noise. And I'll grab a displaced turbulence. Actually, no, wavy turbulence is good for this. So wavy. And if you actually want to see what wavy turbulence looks like, it's like all the way down here. There it is, wavy turbulence. And for this, I'll bring this like scale way down, like 300. That looks like garbage. So let's go back into here, go to the Object tab, and then just bring this height down a little bit. So you can see that just adds a little bit more detail on top there. And why this is nice to have these two noises separated out is I don't have to like build a, uh, you know, a layer shader or whatever and go into here and adjust all these noises at once. I can go in here and just kind of adjust the height individually, which is nice. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is like let's add some hills in the background because we don't want to just see our landscape come to an end. Let's, let's build some hills back there. So for that, I'm going to add yet another displacer. And let's make this a child. It actually, uh, it's important how the order is here because Cinema 4D works sequentially, top to bottom as layers stacks, almost like you know in After Effects you have effects, and the first effect on the top is executed first, and then every effect underneath it. So it'll look different depending on like if I have the higher detail on top or the higher detail on the bottom. You can see a little bit of a change there. But this is going to be our like hills displacer. And for this, I'm going to go into my shading tab. And I'm going to, instead of loading up a noise, I'm going to load up a color. And what this is going to do is it's like this displacer is like full on. So if I move this up, it's just moving everything up. But if I move this super high up, what I can do is actually control this with fields. And fields kind of allow you to define where this displacer is having its effect. And what I'm going to do is let's just grab a spherical field. And you can see we got like a little mesa now. But if I make this bigger here, and let's move the inner, uh, inner fall off here down, we can go into this remapping tab and control like how that fall off is looking. So instead of having just this straight linear fall off, I'll go and use a curve. And now I can use this curve editor or spline editor and kind of round that out a little bit like that. And now what I can do is just kind of move this back. So maybe in the back here, we'll scale that up, T for scale. And you can see this is like a massive hill. I'm from Colorado, so I love the bigger the hills, the better. And uh, I'm just going to make another one here. Uh, so let's go into Displacer again. Let's add another spherical field. 
And to make this blend on top of it, I actually did it uh, automatically, and we're going to set this to max. So it basically is like an add mode on top of this effect. You can think of fields as like a black and white mask. Uh, so let's go, and this is the second one. Let's scale this up. So super big. And we'll just bring this over here. Now, these are pretty massive hills. The cool thing about this is, is if you really make the height here like massive, you can actually just go into and say you want a whole bunch of hills and you want to art direct where they are, you know, have this nice you know leading line or whatever to, to draw your focus. You can place your hills wherever you want, and then you can go into the fields tab and just control the strengths. So it's like, oh, I'll tone that down, I'll tone this down a little bit, something like that. So you have that like flexibility of doing something like that. So always art direct to your heart's content. Uh, and then t speaking of like leading your eye to like this figure, what we can do is like add a nice little path. So maybe have it a little smoother here. And to do that, I'm going to go and I'm just going to create, let's go to uh, my top view here. And I'm just going to draw a spline that will kind of be where the path is. So I'll get my spline pen. And the path will end right here. And this is where I'm going to put that little pug statue that I showed. But just using the figure object for a replacement for right now. And let's go. Let's name this path. And let's go back to our main view. So I got this path here. And let's actually move this up to make sure it's going behind like where our current view is. Go into model mode to actually move this up. So I need to make this spline bigger so it kind of goes off screen right here. And let's go top view again. OK, so that's looking good. Now what we can do is use this path spline as like a field as well to say, like, OK, I don't want any displacement along this spline. So I'm going to go into uh, one of the, let's go into this uh, displacer right here. And let's go into the fields tab. And I can just drag and drop this field or this path into there, and then if I click on this path, this spline, you have this uh, option to use distance mode of just radius. And once I do that, let's crank up this radius. You can kind of see something going on there. Let me move this down a little bit. So something like that. And let's go back into here, or actually the higher detail, and really crank this up, like maybe 200. And you'll see that this is actually reverse. This is actually just having the displacement right here. Uh, so I'm going to go into the remapping tab and invert. And another thing I'm going to do is in the object tab here, right now this is displacing in both positive and negative. And I actually just want to have this displace upward. So I'm just going to have this be intensity. So it's only displacing in one direction, in positive uh, y. I'm going to do the same thing here as well. So just intensity. And you can see it's just pushing everything up. And now on this low detail, I'm going to also drag and drop the path in here. And let's do the invert. And go into whoop, the Fields tab. Go into Object, or actually Layer, and do Radius again. And now you can really start to see, all right, we've got this like nice, smooth spot right here. So now what I could do is just create uh, another plane object and raise this up. And there's like our little path. And what I can do is just choose two materials and apply them separately uh, on each of these. And this is kind of like you could do this and use like a vertex map to mask out like the area you want to put like a path material or stuff like that. But this give, gives you flexibility. You don't need to build like this complex node setup where you're mixing materials. You have two separate objects where you can apply two separate materials to. So this will be our path. So uh, you know it looks a little jinky still. But one thing to keep in mind is you can actually use Redshift to subdivide your meshes at render time. So you can keep things fairly light and even looking janky in your viewport, and then just smooth it out later. I'll cover that in a little bit. Uh, but as far as like your textures and all of those elements that I showed uh, in that final render here, so loud. all of this, except for this little pug, 
uh, the textures and, the, and actually these, some of these trees, it's all using assets from Quixel Bridge, uh, which is owned by Unreal. And I think Grun actually covered some of it. Uh, if you don't know about Unreal and this asset database, uh, it's pretty incredible. And as far as I know, it's, it's free to use. Uh, for your work, I think there's a technicality that you need to be using it on, in Unreal, but you can use it in Cinema 4D. Don't 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 come sue me, Epic. Uh, but, but you can use these assets uh, if you go to I don't know if the internet's working, but if you go to just Unreal and just type in like Quixel Bridge, go search for it. Uh, you can download this app. It's for Mac and PC, and basically it's. It's actually made, they, they had assets all the time. This was actually like 16,600 and something just a few days ago. But they're always adding assets. There's, as you can see, there's over 16,000. And there's, they're basically just like 3D scans of all these objects. So uh, like this Tundra one just came out when I was working on this presentation. You got like all these cool rocks that are 3D scanned and like little elements like this. And so you can download all of these. The meshes are actually fairly light. It's not like a super dense mesh. But if, uh, uh, let's see, I have like some favorited stuff that I use. So these are all the assets that I used and found on uh, Quixel Bridge to, uh, to use for my presentation. And the one thing I'll say about choosing your assets is like I wanted some ground cover. Because if we go back to, and this is where it's great to use like references. Because I love this little, uh, let me make this bigger. You can see they've got like all this kind of like almost fuzz, clover, moss kind of stuff. And then you have like these little plants that are popping up and you got this giant tree trunk in the in the foreground here and then some mossy trees in the back. Uh, and then you got some rocks here. So I just love this ground cover and then adding bigger plants and just kind of layering up all those different details because that will help you make it look more realistic, like more natural. So if everything looks the same, that's not really uh, nature. You can see all these plants are different sizes and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, so just when you're choosing those assets, like I always go for like a small detail, a medium detail, and like a bigger detail. So I have like the small, medium, large, and then I have like just other elements like this. Like I'll have big rocks, and then I'll have like a cluster of rocks because you're not just going to have giant boulders everywhere. You always have smaller uh, rocks as well. So you're just going to mix in all these assets. And then I have some like more uh, like hero elements. So initially, I was just using this like this Japanese statue uh, for a placeholder before I did the pug, and then some stone pillars and and all these different trees. So I was like, this one is a good hero element for like a tree, and then like this dead tree as well is really good. Fortunately, may, uh, Quixel Bridge doesn't have a lot of like nice tree elements, so you'd use Forester if if you've heard of Forester. Uh, but there's also really good assets in the asset uh, browser for Cinema 4D as well. Uh, but actually, it's like incredibly easy how you can use uh, Quixel Bridge. Uh, the first thing you're going to want to do is when you install, you can actually install this uh, a plugin for Cinema 4D. You can say, OK, all these assets, where do, I, where do I need to export these out? You can just choose Cinema 4D. And the one important thing is that uh, you want to have whatever uh, render engine you're using in the project that you, you want to add these assets to. Make sure you set your renderer. Because what you can do is actually export out directly out of Bridge. And it will import all of the textures and have it already applied and the nodes set up very nicely uh, for the render engine that you have set in your project. So if you want to, let's start with. Uh, some like nice ground color, this wood sorrel. Uh, let's go back here. And you can see all the different types of this type of leaf. So you can imagine, like, OK, I got all these. I'm going to clone a whole bunch and make a bunch of ground cover for my scene. You can see there's a whole bunch of other elements here, too. You can see I downloaded it. And if this was set up correctly, I couldn't figure out how to get this like plugin set up. But you could just ex hit export. You can see it's exporting the Cinema 4D. I didn't install this. Uh, this thing all uh, correctly, but I do have a video of it actually working nicely. Whoop, accidentally opened another Cinema 4D. Uh, let's see. So we'll go here. And this is like how it's working. So these are all the textures uh, and also materials. So not only 3D models, but uh, you have textures, uh, all types of stuff. Like there's so much stuff. And like I said, it's like it's all free as long as you sign up for an Unreal account. 
Uh, you can check all the different types of texture elements that you can export as well. And then let's go to where I export. Yeah, to do that. Set your renderer. OK, so this is where it shows where it actually exports uh, correctly. It'll bring in this material. And if you double click it, it's a Redshift material. And it's already got everything all set up. So it comes with your albedo texture. It's already plugged in. You have your roughness already plugged in. You have your normal. It's already going to create a bump map for you. Uh, your transmission, which is uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, about later. It's got your displacement. It's already set up. So your, your texture is already done. Like if you go to uh, COO textures, I forget what it's called now, but you would have to manually download each of these different uh, nodes or different like texture files and then rebuild it manually. But uh, with Bridge, it just does it automatically, which is amazing. So let me get out of this and then go back to here. Uh, and then I have, let's see. Textures are already added here. And let's fire up Redshift. Hit play. Let's dock this here. And here you can see these textures. Whoa, it went all the way up here. Uh-oh. <laughs> all right. Well, it's a good thing I opened another Cinema 4D because that's our backup. <laughs> and. Uh, OK, let's go to this again. There we go. Let's try this again. Open project. Oh, not that. Let's go here. Uh, let's go. OK, there's our textures. So you can see I even imported uh, some of these uh, these textures that are applied to some of the little small mossy plants as well. Uh, and let's go and fire up Redshift again and cross our fingers. All right, I'm going to fire this up, and I'm not going to dock it yet. <laughs> it's doing its thing. There it is. Let's actually throw in a sun and sky object in here just to see what we're doing. There we go. And let's really crank up the intensity here. Oh, there we go. There it updated. OK. Uh, one thing to do if you have like a, a like more laggy viewport or you're using like a, an older Mac, like I have an older Mac, and Redshift actually runs on it now because you have the CPU ability, what I like to do is go into your Redshift render view, go to View, go to IPR undersampling, and this will kind of like, you'll get this lower res preview, but you can now have this like snappy uh, kind of viewport here. So it gets really pixelated at first, and then it clears up. So this is an easier way to like, you know, get a little sense of everything. Uh, but it looks super pixelated. Another thing I like to do just to speed things up a little bit as well, uh, let's go to the advanced. The progressive passes sometimes is like overkill. I don't need this to be constantly calculating. I'll do 72 and bring that down. Cool. So what we can do at this point is you know, our textures aren't looking uh, all that great, uh, because what we can actually do is all these textures, these ground textures, have displacement, but the displacement's not added yet. So you can see, to get Redshift displacement working, you actually have to add a Redshift uh, render tag, a Redshift object tag. And this is where you can actually turn on and activate your displacement. So let's see this clear up here a little bit. And let's see how this is looking. Whoop. Have this clear up. What's going on with this one? Let's just close this. This is what I use all the time since I've used a uh, PC. Let's see. Actually, it's, it's not frozen, so that's good. I'll just end that anyways. Life of PC life. OK, so, <laughs> so let's go in here and uh, these maximum displacement and displacement scale. So you can see a little bit of displacement, but not a ton. Uh, what this number is here is like how much displacement can you possibly have? Uh, and if you don't have this number high enough, you're going to get like this 
plateauing because you don't have enough maximum displacement level. So I'll just like hit five. And then this displacement scale is actually a modifier or an amplifier for whatever number you have set right here in your displacement node. So right here I have a scale of one. If I go into this tag and up this displacement scale to two, we're basically doubling the uh, displacement scale. So now you should see a lot more pronounced uh, displacement here as this is kind of clearing up. We can really, let's do five, let's do 10 and just really see this displacement. That di displacement is going to uh, add that nice extra detail and, and realism here once this kind of clears up. And another thing I like to do as well is by default, your displacer node uh, will come in, let me reset this. It'll actually come in like this, where you're only, like I was showing you how you can displace in one direction and both directions at the same time, so uh, pushing upwards and displacing downwards. When you, uh, by default, add a red sh uh, redshift displacement node, you're actually only displacing upwards, but if you want to displace both positive and negative up and down, what you can do is remap your range of Displacement, uh, instead of just having it zero to one, you can actually have negative one to one, which means you can actually have negative displacement, displacement going down. So you always want to check that sometimes de depending on like your uh, displacer here. So there is uh, basically doing the ground. Let's go to uh, ground cover real quick. So let's go and add ground cover. Now Redshift comes with an awesome tool called uh, Redshift Scatter that allows you to scatter like literally you can have like scatter a million of like this ground cover. So here is like this this sorrel which is basically your uh, your little clover and scatter it all throughout your scene. So let's do that real quick. I'm going to go to Redshift Objects uh, Redshift or Med uh, Matrix Scatter. And what this allows you to do is if I go into this Redshift object, you can actually clone and use matrices as uh, placeholders in your viewport. And it will render whatever you put in here. So instead of optimized spheres, I want to say actually render custom objects. And what I can do now is the Sorrel, you can see all these different types of Sorrel uh, models that we got from uh, Quixel. So I'm just going to go and let's lock this view. And let's go up here and let's grab all of these. And, and just drop them right in there. And you can actually like randomize how they're selected here. And while we're in here, let's go, instead of creating a grid of matrices, I'm going to say, actually, let's clone matrices onto an object. And that object will be our ground. And let's really crank this up, like 400,000. Why not? So we got a whole bunch of matrix objects or matrices there. And let's move. We don't want these to show up in our scene and clutter up our viewport. So what I can do is just hide these elements, just move it down, just hide it right below the ground there. Uh, and then you're not, it doesn't look like anything, but when we go to get our Redshift render view firing up and hit play. You'll see that all of these matrices will be, whoop, look at all those, those uh, little clovers. And you can see they're actually all rotated the wrong way. So we can just go into transform and I think we just need to do like negative 90 here. And then I'll have them facing straight up. You can see how many of these we got in our scene. And this is my viewport here. And it's just like, whoop. It's not bogging down the viewport because it's adding all these objects at render time, which is super cool. So you can keep your scene very light. Uh, and I have a dual 3090, which is one more uh, CPU than this computer right here. And holy cow, it flies. Uh, but you can see that uh, you know we have some intersection here with our path. And you know, actually, it doesn't look too bad. But if we wanted to remove all of the uh, bits that are right here intersecting our path, we can actually use, uh, because this is a, a, a MoGraph object, we can say, actually, let's go and add a MoGraph uh, selection tag. And in the selection tag, you can say, 
Oh, I still have this locked. Always remember to unlock your view here. And then go up here. And you can actually use fields to determine which uh, to select different uh, matrices. So I'm going to delete this freeze tag here. And then just drag and drop that path spline into here. And let's actually pause this real quick. And you can see that we have all these selections. And I'm going to do the same thing I did with the spline, using it for uh, to kind of control where the displacement was happening. And go to radius. And then you can see nothing's really getting selected. But if I go and I crank up the radius to 200, you can see I'm selecting all these clones. And now what I want to do is say, OK, Cinema 4D, hide all these selected clones so they don't render and they're not generating matrices. So with that Redshift matrix object selected, I'm going to go to MoGraph and go to Hide Selected. And you can see that just removes some of these matrices here. And it's very linear, right? So what we can do is add a little bit of randomization in here. So we can go to our fields, go to Random, and then we can just set this to Overlay. And that will kind of break up the edges. And this looks way more natural, what you would see in, in nature. And now if I hit uh, the Render button again, you should see a lot of these just like go away. Wait for it. There you go. So you can see that remove. We got this nice randomization in there. Uh, another thing we can do is with this matrix object, again, this is a MoGraph object, so you can apply all of your effectors to it as well. So let's go in here. Let's add a, you can add a random effector. And you can randomize. Actually, we don't want this to use that MoGraph selection, so I'll delete that. And what we'll do is we don't want to move the position. We'll adjust the rotation. And I believe we rotate like this. Yeah. So we'll add some random rotation in H. Let's go like 360, 3600. And then we can randomize the scale as well. So uniform scale. And so now we'll have, again, you want to mimic nature. Nothing is perfectly the same size. We'll add some you know, random scale in here. And this is going to look a lot more uh, realistic, right? So that's basically how you create your ground cover using some MoGraph and matrix, uh, matrix, Redshift Matrix. Again, it's all applied at, uh, at render time. Uh, let's go here. And so you get your ground cover, right? You got, I just did the same thing for uh, using the different kind of plants, because remember, we're using like small plants, medium plants, big plants. So you get that uh, nice detail. Let's get this Redshift render view going again. And uh, what I want to do now is bring in some trees. So again, you can use Forester or whatever you want to do. But inside the Red uh, Cinema 4D Asset Browser, there's a whole lot of models, and you can just easily search like trees. And you see all these different size plants and stuff like that looking really nice in a Redshift render view here. Uh, and let's just do tree. And you can see all of these different types of trees that you can use. I chose, let's see, where are the trees that I chose? Uh, Hornbeam and uh, Hornbeam Small. So again, to, to mimic nature, you want your big trees, your, your baby trees, and stuff like that, and mix them all in. So you can just download these assets, uh, bring them into Cinema. Thing is, is that they'll come in as uh, normal C4D materials. So we need to translate these and convert these to Redshift. So I'm just going to select these materials that got applied to our tree here. You see, it looks pretty nice. Uh, and we're just going to go to. Uh, Let's see, texture. Actually, let's see, where is the. Actually, right click, go to. Well, it's not in this menu. Where is that menu? Select material. Material convert. It's somewhere else in the new version. Material exchanger? Texture? Material channels? Oh, convert. There it is. No, that's not it. 
All right. Well, there is an option here. I think it's someplace else in R26. You can convert. Let me just <laughs> find where. I'm going to try one more time. Where is it? Here. Sort. Remove. Yeah. Because this, OK, let me, is this, this version died. Let me just. Because with R26, uh, they actually integrated Redshift into it. So it's in like the Redshift stuff is actually integrated into those menus. And I'm not sure where it is. Let me just get that out of there. But actually, ooh, it might be in Redshift. There we go. Texture, nope. Materials, utilities, tools. There we go. Convert and replace materials. Woo! It's in, it's in that Redshift menu, but in R26, it's actually in this menu here, built into Cinema 4D. So I've just been using R26 for so long, I forgot where the old way was. Uh, so utilities, uh, no, tools. Convert and replace. Boom. Open this up. It's already converted everything perfectly, right? So we got the bark. And then one important thing is the, uh, the, the leaf. Because one thing we want to do with the leaf, if you'll notice with like the ferns and stuff like that, we actually have some translucency bumped into, plugged into the translucency color of this backlighting area. And this is actually super important because when light hits a plant, it just doesn't stop. Like light scatters through the plant or paper. Like if you tr shine a flashlight at a paper, you're going to see it like illuminates and you can see it's very uh, like a thin uh, object. So we're going to do that with uh, these leaves to make it look a little bit more realistic. So there's our tree. This will update. I'm going to go into this material here. You can see how it, like dark it is underneath these leaves. So I'm going to go into, we got our uh, redshift shader. That's our uh, leaf texture. I'm going to plug this into our uh, diffuse translucence color. So now, nothing happened yet, but if I crank up this weight of the translucency, Watch right here. You can see how now it's much more bright and it looks more realistic because the sun's passing through and scattering through and passing through the, the very thin object. So this is great if you want to render paper and you want a little bit of that light to come through. If I turn this down again, you're going to see how dark that looks. So this just adds that nice leaf and plant uh, leafiness. Uh, so that's that. And then uh, once you got that going, we can start scattering trees all throughout this scene. So let's go here. Let's go to doo -doo -doo -doo. So I got uh, those two trees, the young tree, the old tree. And then uh, from Quixel, I added this like dead tree. Because, you know, not all trees are going to be nice and healthy in a forest. Uh, and so you gotta, you got to also add that variety, right? So I have these three trees, and I just want to scatter a whole bunch of them. And I'm just going to move these two trees down underneath to hide them. And what I'm going to do is in, I believe, Cinema 4D R24, they added all these really cool like placements tools, scatter tools. And there's a scatter placement tool, which allows you to basically, and I know there's something like this in uh, Unreal Engine as well, where you can just use an asset. And I'm actually selecting these three objects that I want to paint with. And uh, what we can do is, so they remain in their original uh, alignment. I'm going to say align to object and not like the surface. You can have it aligned to the surface. Uh, but I can just, I have those three objects selected. I'm just going to start painting. And Bob Ross will be happy because we're painting all these happy trees. And you can see all these like circles and like what's going on there. If we go to this uh, option here, you can see the radius here is just literally the radius of the brush. And then we have this object spacing, which is like which the object's personal space. So what we can do is like actually make this negative, And we're actually making more trees in each of those little uh, radiuses, radii. So if I really bring this down, like negative 300, you can see I just, with one simple brush stroke, whoa, brush stroke went all the way out there. Uh, but you can paint all these different types of trees and really start to build things up, 
right? Let me undo <laughs> that weird thing that happened there. And you can see all of this is created in a scatter object. Let me just go ahead and delete that scatter object and try again. So let's do this. And we're just painting. Actually, I don't have any objects selected, so it's not going to paint anything. I'm just going to select these three trees again and paint. And the cool thing about this is, is I can go in here. We got our little hero element here. And I can start to compose my shot, right? And there's like, all right, there's this dumb tree standing right here in the middle of the shot. In real life, you just have to chop down that tree. But in using the scatter tool, we can actually erase and remove some of these elements as well. So I'm just going to remove this. And actually, I think the floor is in the way, so I'll turn off the floor. And I'll say, erase this. Let's make this bigger. Erase this. Whoop. Too big of a brush. But you can see how you can kind of art direct all this kind of stuff. So I'll erase that. And if I wanted to move a tree, I can literally go in, choose the scatter object. And I'll rename this tree. And I can art direct again, wear the art director hat, and say, OK, actually, I want to move this tree over here and kind of move things around. Because the random placement's great, but I can go in here and use the place tool, uh, select this tree, and just kind of move it around. And you can see it's aligning to the surface. I don't actually want that. I want to keep the orientation of the original object. And with all these scatter, I can start to really place these wherever I want, which is really cool. Another thing that's awesome with the uh, scatter pen is while you're scattering elements, and I forgot to go to scatter tool, you can go in here and again, like we used MoGraph object or MoGraph effectors to randomize the rotation and the scale. You can actually do this directly in this tool. So I can go and adjust the minimum scale and the maximum scale of the object. I can adjust the rotation, which I don't know what rotation it might be, but you can actually build in that random uh, rotation into rotation and scale into when you're painting, which is really cool. And why isn't this working now? But yeah, all right. So we scatter a bunch of stuff. Uh, let's go into our scene where uh, I got a whole bunch of other assets. You can see a stump. So again, we want to add that variety in there, add these rocks, add these little cool things to break up like the the similar nature of all the assets we have. Because really, we have three types of trees, three types of plants. Uh, and then we want to you know, mix it up so it doesn't just look like we're using just three types of plants in our, uh, in our scene. So let's go into here. And you can see I have all these assets in here. I'm just going to use that placement tool again and just start placing things in a line to the surface. So here's like my hero tree. I'll kind of move this over here. And the cool thing is, let's actually go and grab our two views stacked. And I can actually you know, have my locked camera view that I want to compose my composition with. And then just move this around here. And you'll see this little gizmo. This is scale. And this is rotation, this little rotation band. So I don't even have to use shortcut keys. It's just like right there in the little placement object. And I can just quickly like, OK, rock here. Uh, let's actually bring up in our camera, let's get all composition-y. And let's bring up our composition helpers. And I'm going to have a grid. And I'm going to have the ye old golden spiral, which is amazing. So I can just like compose my shot to have like the hero object here. And I can just build these elements and position them along the way to uh, to place these assets. And I learned this from uh, David Ariev's Lights, Camera, Render class, all about composition. Woo! Uh, so yeah, I'm just building, you know, having leading lines, uh, all that kind of stuff. And you just place your objects. And I can hit Command or Control, uh, Command and Control click, and I can duplicate that. And it's automatically going to add that as an instance. And I can change this to Render Instance. So I can add all these different types of rocks. And it's already going to be like optimized for this scene, which is super cool. Uh, so that is basically uh, how I built out the scene. And I'm running out of time. And I haven't gotten over lighting yet, but I am presenting again on Wednesday at 12.30. So in that presentation, I'll cover a little bit more of the lighting. I'll even show you how I modeled and sculpted my little pug uh, model here. So let me just show you a little preview of that. So come on back here on Wednesday, and I'll cover more about lighting. Uh, and composition and all that kind of stuff, how to get fog, god rays, stuff like that. 
Uh, but that's the basics of how to just like use Quixel Bridge, use some of the awesome tools in Cinema 4D, like your placement tools, your scatter tools, using MoGraph uh, to you know do different things like make a path, because you can always go in here and adjust this path to place wherever you want. You know, so you have that full flexibility, art directability, and that's the great part about Cinema 4D and why I love it is because all of this is live. All of this you can continue to change and build out a bunch of different landscapes and, and really create whatever kind of landscape you want and you know, compose to a, a fixed kind of shot like that. So let me just show the final render again. So again, just placing all these ferns. You got the ground cover here. There's our path, that different texture, a few different rock elements. Like Quixel is amazing. So uh, yeah, that'll be it. Let me go and get my PowerPoint. Whoop. So we didn't get to bonus time. We'll get to bonus time on Wednesday. But thank you all so much. Uh, if you have any questions about literally anything about Cinema 40, I love nerding out about this stuff. Come see me here on the floor or whatever. Or if you have any questions about literally anything, hit, always hit me up on Twitter, on the Instagrams, on the web, on my YouTubes. Uh, but thank you guys so much. All right. Great job as usual. Ooh. 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 You Back got up. too close to me. Back up, man. Got too close oh, to me. Don't cross the streams. <laughs> All right. Um, so we have time for some questions. Either you did a thorough job or they're totally intimidated. It was the pug. I know. I know. It's the pug. It's an intimidating it pug. pug. How many donuts, donuts tall, tall was the pug? I mean, you could probably get like eight donuts tall for a pug. <laughs> eight donuts. Folks. Like, is it standing up or is it just down? Yeah. Yeah. Eight donuts tall. But. The internet is brave. The internet has questions. Yeah. Okay. Don't Ooh, break the mic. This little thing went down. My beard messed it up. Yeah. The beard gri grips the mic. Beard grip. Beard grip. All right. So the question is, um, prehistoric art question. Which tree branch did you use for your brush? Tree branch. Well, I used the tree. You used prehistoric. The tr yeah. They're like. Well, what, that actually, that's branch? the cool thing you about. Know what, you know what it was? Do you know the fern? Then you know the fern type. It's a lady fern. There you go. There's there you a go, lady internet. fern. Broadleaf. Palm. And one of the cool things about uh, Quixel is like, I didn't even do this in my scene, but you can scatter a bunch of uh, branches and stuff as well. So you have like these like collections of flowers and random flora and fauna for yeah, the, look at this. So for you the just jungle got, floor. Yeah, jungle floor. So you could literally, you know, I was scattering all the trees. You can literally download. That almost looks like antler, antlers, but you can download like leaves and literally place leaves wherever the heck you want, like fallen leaves on the ground, all that kind of stuff. Got some cherry blossoms. Uh, but yeah, it's like incredible the amount of stuff that is uh, in Quixel. Another question for you is, could you create a group field that ha held a spline and drop the group into each displacer? Yes, so you can reuse. Yeah, that's actually an easier way to do it. Use a group field, and you can actually have that group be in each of these uh, fields here. And yeah, you only have to like adjust one, I think. Yeah. And then so you only have to adjust one, and yeah, everything in the group. But the nice thing about this is like maybe I want the small noise to be a little bit in more, so I would want that kind of control. So if you don't need that control, yeah, you can totally use a group field. And a lot of the people don't know a lot about group fields, too. So if you don't know about group fields, I think the NASA's has some training on Cineversity, but that's a great point. Knows man knows. Knows man so, knows. So uh, yeah, check that out, group fields on Cineversity, um, or one of our many training sessions. So we have tr constant training sessions. Check them out. Um, yeah, so just check under our events. You'll see those as well. So you can also ask our trainers. More questions is, um, why are you using the Redshift Matrix instead of a regular cloner? So, uh, oh yeah, I didn't cover that. So the mat Redshift Matrix is actually going to be speedier in your viewport. And because, like I said, it's going to keep your viewport light. And because you're just using matrices in the, in the uh, viewport here. Also, one thing I didn't cover as well is sometimes there's uh, some uh, like order of operations stuff. So you want to make sure your actual matrix objects below 
your uh, your the things you're cloning onto, and then sometimes if you're still getting weird stuff with uh, rendering, go into your priority and go to generators and up this. And sometimes you'll get a little glitchy, so that will fix like any priority issues. So nice little top there. But uh, yeah, this is just using uh, utilizing the the Redshift render engine versus a cloner, where you're basically using just viewport Cinema 4D viewport uh, speed. Uh, I'm not. I haven't tested which is like faster, but I will t on Wednesday. I'll show an alternative where you can actually use a cloner to clone onto this matrix object to actually visually see all of your objects in your scene and still have a light viewport as well. Nice. All right. Let's see here. The final video feels uh, painterly. How was it achieved? So, any special render uh, settings or anything you need? No. So, actually, I'll cover this on Wednesday. Hey, That's come back. Look at that. Come back. Oh, I know. See, I'm teasing. Great, great upsell. upsell. Yeah. Look at that. So, it's actually... I mean, you'll have to find out. No, yeah. it's actually... Uh, Next it's, time on EJ Presents. It's no. all... I'll, I'll just give this away. It's all in the Redshift post settings. So... Yeah, come on, come on back Wednesday. I'll cover that exact thing. Yeah, get that different style. Yeah. Um, let's see. Do the bloopy blurp sounds come? Oh, do these sounds bloop blurp come from watching? Bloop blurp. What? I don't know. Bloop blurp. Is it an inside thing? Who asked that question? Who is asked that, that question? Mom, Lily? mom. Mom, why would you ask me a bloop blurp? <laughs> Who is that? Who are you, Internet? <laughs> yeah. All right, awesome. Thanks again, EJ. Thank you. And he'll be back Wednesday, so definitely check it out. He yes. had all those teasers. Another round of applause. We'll be back here in about four or five minutes with our next presenter, Sasha Vinogradova. So stay yes. tuned.